Erev Tov and welcome everyone. It is the month of Elul. Uh, we're actually well through the month of Elul, which means that Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are right around the corner um, and Slichot is coming up. And that means that is, it is inevitable that people are going to start posting on Facebook um, the very common uh, message of, if I have hurt anyone this year, please forgive me. Um, and it, it's not always that impersonal. Um, people that I love dearly often do the call right before, often air of Rosh Hashanah or Erev Yom Kippur, if I hurt you in any way this past year, please forgive me. Now, when you hear that, it sounds lovely. And in no way am I going to imply that is a bad thing. But one of the questions is, is that truly a sincere form of apology? It's conditional to begin with, if I did it. Well, that implies, or perhaps implies, if not explicitly, implicitly, that I don't think I hurt somebody. If I actually hurt somebody, then I would say, I hurt you this year. Or even to say, did I hurt you this year? I don't know if you remember, but I want to, you know, I want to find out, did I hurt you in any of this year? And they say, actually, you did. Then you can actually work on it. And we'll talk about what that work can look like. But the question is, and, and, and Jane, I think it might have been you, Jane, that had a more specific question connected to this. But my general premise or my general question is, before Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, when people make those calls and say, if I hurt you in any way this year, um, I apologize, does that really do anything? And I don't necessarily mean experientially. Again, it's a nice gesture. But in terms of the kind of healing, the kind of effort and work that needs to go into repairing relationships, and we'll read about uh, what that should look like later on, does that do anything? Is that really a kosher apology? And again, if I get any pushback on, well, I think that's important and everyone does it, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But for people who do just that, or if there's someone I really haven't hurt, there are people I have a relationship where I genuinely have not hurt them this year. Do I need to call them up at all and apologize if I haven't done anything? There are people that I have hurt this year and I absolutely should call them up. But if somebody I've had a good relationship do I need to do that blanket statement? So that's what we're going to explore tonight. But before we get into some of the classical sources that talk about the expectations for what a genuine apology before Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur looks like, I actually want to step back to, oh no, we've lost Jane. Hopefully she'll be back in a moment. I want to look at some contemporary sources on what a good, real apology looks like. And one of the things that we can think about is how many of these ideas are reflected in some of the classical sources that we are going to look at? So this first source here is, it's an abridgment. I cut out a lot of the text from an article from the Psychology Today website. It's a popular source, but it's really, they're often quite well written um, and often well uh, sourced, even if they're not of the highest academic standard, but it's a really good source to get a good um, common sense approach to how to talk to people, how to build and heal relationships. So Elizabeth, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you as you are apparently cleaning your glasses. So now you should be able to think it, uh, to see it. And there are eight quick points here that we should attempt to include in a sincere apology. And if an apology doesn't have all of these, that doesn't mean it's not a good one, but this is kind of the gold standard and what we should keep in mind. And by the way, as you read this list, even though this requires a lot of effort, you'll see that it's not so hard if you're really doing the work to do all eight of these at once. They all kind of work together if you're sincere and if you've done the, you know, the real work on trying to fix a, a relationship when you have harmed someone. So go ahead, uh, Elizabeth, please. Uh, number, point number one. Be clear about what you are apologizing for. I'm sorry you're upset or I'm sorry if you took it wrong are not true apologies for your own behavior. That doesn't mean they don't have a place, but if a true apology for your specific actions is what is called for, they're not an adequate substitute. Excellent. And that kind of hints towards our question about just calling and saying, you know, if I hurt you in any way, then I apologize for that. Again, it's not bad, but it's not genuine work. And more importantly, it's not really taking responsibility. If I, again, put on Facebook, which is the, you know, the, the lowest form of this and saying anybody who I've hurt, I'm sorry, that doesn't mean I don't mean that but I'm not really taking responsibility because I can't think of anything. If I actually hurt people, which it's very likely all of us have done, then unless I actually take the work to figure out how I hurt someone and reach out to them and make myself vulnerable, um, that it's not really taking responsibility and it's not really much of an apology. I can't say sorry for something that I'm not aware that I have 
done. Um, next point, please, Elizabeth. Don't add conditions where conditions don't belong. I'm sorry I said X, but if you hadn't done Y, then I would never have been so upset. Maybe true but it is also prone to escalating the conflict and making it sound like you're not very sorry at all. Excellent. And again, it's that similar idea of not taking full responsibility for our actions. I didn't, it's, I didn't really do anything bad. It was your fault. Like, I'm sorry I hurt you. And like, I, I recognize that I said that those mean words, but it was really your fault. That's not apologizing. Um, and again, some of these, all of us here might be guilty of them. I've definitely done that um, at times. They're also very human. Um, and it's just becoming aware of this kind of language and trying to think about what the other person is hearing. Um, please, and by the way, if anyone, Elizabeth, you or anyone has a question or comment, we'll pause at the end of this list of eight, but you can jump in in the middle um, with either a personal anecdote or, or a thought on how this strikes you or what you can add to it. Uh, Elizabeth, number three, please. Your apology should stand on its own. Don't apologize as a means to get what you want. And again, that's true in all relationships. And, and this article is really good about not making it about, uh, you know, dating couple or a married couple. This isn't everything like that. But plenty of people don't really want to apologize or still angry, but they want to, you know, make the peace or get something out of it. And they apologize. And that really takes away with the sincerity because one can't be sincerely apologizing if they don't actually feel apologetic. If they're doing it to, you know, as a, an, a, an end, uh, justifying the ends with the means. Um, number four, please. Know the difference between explaining and justifying. Explaining why you did something can sometimes help the other person understand what happened. But there's a fine line between that and making excuses for your behavior. Yeah, and this is a very subtle and very challenging one um, to even attempt this. And sometimes it's better to not just, sometimes it's better to say, I know it hurt you. I'm sorry for what I did. I'm sorry I hurt you. I don't want to explain myself. Sometimes explaining, you know, I was, I was angry, you know, I misunderstood, that might help it. But to say that I did it because I thought I was right, I did it because I thought you were, you know, justifying again, it takes away from the power. And again, it comes back to not taking full responsibility for our actions. Um, so it's very important. But again, that's a tough one about explaining why we did something. Sometimes it really is just okay to generally say, I messed up, I screwed up, I'm sorry. And that is sincere and that is powerful. Um, if that's what the other person hears. Please continue number five. Express remorse with empathy. If you don't feel actual remorse within an apology, ask yourself why you're doing it and whether it's just a charade that you're apologizing at all. And, and this can be connected to number three. I'm apologizing because I just want the other person to not be mad at me. I want to move on. Um, it's someone who you want to go hang out with. You're going on a trip and you just want it to be not awkward. So you apologize and hope that they just move on. But if you don't actually feel bad about what you think, there's even a Hebrew word, um, harata, um, remorse, regretting it. But again, why, why am I apologizing? Because I recognize I'm taking responsibility, recognize that what I did was wrong, or I'm just trying to make the problem go away. And this is very interesting vis-a-vis -vis Yom Kippur, because if the only reason I'm apologizing is so that God will forgive me and I don't you know, die early, um, is that a sincere apology? So it's a very interesting uh, question about if I have a sincere apology, but I'm doing it for ulterior motives, does that mean, it, but it actually helps the other person and helps our relationship. Does that mean there's no value in it? So some of these points are quick tips. There's a lot more unpacking that could be done here studying uh, human psychology. Number six, please. Have a plan for it to not happen again. Yeah, this is probably, I, I think it's one of the most difficult things on there because people can genuinely, sincerely apologize, but then they do the same thing five minutes later. Does that mean the apology was not sincere? Not necessarily. They may just have some personal work they need to do on some very um, just challenging habits that it's really difficult to overcome. But ideally, real apology means that the person is also going to do work on why that happened in the first place. And again, that could be very complicated from I am genuinely sorry that I showed up late to work and I know it affected my whole team to I am sorry that I lost my temper, which requires a lot more therapeutic type work to control that versus setting my alarm to get me out five minutes early. So again, a lot of the items on this list are incredibly important to repairing the damage. Um, and by the way, I'm talking about interpersonal relationships, which is the point of tonight, but a lot of these can apply when we are asking for God's forgiveness on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. 
something to keep in the back of our heads. Um, number seven, please, Elizabeth. Be open to repairing and making further amends. So if I just say, I'm sorry, can we just move on, forget it never happened? That's not that there's again, no value in that, but it, it kind of shows that there's something lack in the apology. I genuinely am sorry and I'm willing. And again, there's also making oneself vulnerable. People don't like saying sorry because it opens them up to criticism for what they did. It opens up to you know a potential feeling like they might get wounded. I, if I say I'm sorry because I messed up, that person might not attack me, but dig into me a little bit and point out what I did wrong. And that, that hurts. I don't wanna feel attacked. I don't wanna feel vulnerable. So it's, I'd rather just forget about it and move on. But that again, takes so much away from the apology. And if my goal is to better the relationship with the other, whether human or God, if I just say, I'm sorry, move on, it's never really going to get better. And the last one of this list, and again, I'm sure there are many other lists, and it's all part of a beautiful process. But number eight here, please, Elizabeth. Listen, ultimately, an apology shouldn't just be about you. Don't get so caught up in your own words that you forget to listen to theirs. Yeah. Again, if I apologize because I want the problem to go away, it's for me. If I am empathetically, you know, feel for the other person and know that they are in pain or they're angry at me and I care about them deeply, um, again, it doesn't make it easy, but it really changes the nature of the apology. Now, again, this list is a popular version um, of a much broader conversation, a lot of work, and I'm not suggesting reading self-help books, but anyone here who has ever been a human being before has done some version of this list, done it poorly at times, or there are times when we apologized and we've said, actually, I, I really was sincere and I took responsibility and it doesn't mean it was easy. And I did feel scared and vulnerable, but oh my goodness, the work afterwards, I had a friend in college where uh, we got in a fight and I did, I did the work. And the first time I apologized, it wasn't good and it backfired, but eventually worked on it. And our friendship after that was, you know, we were tighter than ever, but we had to go through a really tough spot. And I had to make myself really vulnerable. And it was the worst feeling in the world, but it was nothing in comparison to the good feeling of getting a friend back. And that's why this is so important. And again, it doesn't just speak to humans, but our relationship with God. So if I didn't do anything else in this class and we just went based on this non-halachic source of psychology today, the question of is a Facebook message or a quick phone call, if I hurt you, I'm sorry, does that really cut it? Not really. It's not bad, and I'm not saying don't do it at all, but if we are meant to truly apologize and repair the damage we've done, it's a lot of work, and it's worth it. That's the other thing that one can't you know, just say it's worth it unless they've gone through it, but this work is very much worth it, very, very important, and going through it really does prepare us for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, because if we can open ourselves up and become vulnerable and take responsibility for our actions between each other, then it really helps in the relationship between us and God. So before we go on into some of the classical sources, any questions up until now? Excellent. So the next, I'll have actually take the next two sources, Tamar. One of the most important ones that's sort of, in some ways, the basis for this whole class is, why are we talking about apologizing to people? You know, that's Yom Kippur is a magic day. I say the prayers on Yom Kippur. I put my heart into it. I show up for 50 hours or whatever it is. I do the fast. Aren't I forgiven? Oh, what do I need to do all this work before Yom Kippur? Because Tamar, as the Mishnah explicitly says, source number two, please. Yom Kippur atones for transgressions between a person and God. But for a, for a transgression against one's neighbor, Yom Kippur cannot atone until he appears his, appeases Jesus. his neighbor. Excellent. Thank you. And two language things to point out here. I pointed this out um, in the past, uh, this word atone. I don't recall exactly the, the, the etymology of it, but it is not a good translation for um, kapara, like Yom Kippur. It has a Christian basis, and the meaning is not wildly off. It's not a bad word, um, but it misses what kapara is. Kapara is probably something like God, we did something wrong and we deserve a punishment. But we say, God, instead of punishing us, will you accept something in our place? Money, our, our forgiveness, um, a, 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 a literal sacrifice, an offering, a korban, all of those things are prayers. 
we offer something, God, will you take that instead of us? Sometimes literally instead of our lives. And God's answer on Yom Kippur, we believe, is yes, I accept something as kapara, as covering up for you instead of you being punished. Um, and it's essentially God giving us a second chance. Now, with our friends, we usually don't have to sacrifice something. You know, I'll give up, my, I'll give you my car if you're friends with me again. But there are some relationships where that might be the thing. I will work a weekend for you at your job if you'll, you know, forgive me to show that I care about you more than my time. You are more valuable to me than anything I own. That's the message we give to God. And the other word here that's really important is Yom Kippur. The, the concept is Yom Kippur. God doesn't forgive us or give us a second chance until we fix the relationships with other people and they give us a second chance. And the key word here is uh, um, which a translate is actually the word appeasing here, taking care of what they want and basically making them feel better about it, trying to fix the relationship. Uh, appeasement is actually a pretty good translation. Yeah, go ahead, Tamar, please. Sheyeratse. Ah, thank you, thank you. Sheyeratse. Sheyeratse. It's a transferable action. That not sheyeratse is that you yourself will win, but you want to appease. You want to him to accept your apology. So it's yeratse. Thank you for that correction. So I'd say, I'd say, but appeasement is a very good translation. And uh, Tamar corrected me and added um, better meaning to that. But again, it's not just enough to say sorry. We actually have to do something in the relationship between us and people before we can even walk into Yom Kippur. So the question about, and Jane, I see your hand there. The question about is a Facebook apology enough? And if it's not, that's a problem. Because if we think a Facebook apology or just a call, if I hurt you in any way, fixes everything, and it doesn't really, then Yom Kippur, it's questionable how effective it will be. Um, yeah, Jane, go ahead. I wanted to ask Tamar about Yeratse. So it, Yeratse is Kal and Yeratse is P-L? Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm just not seeing how, how it goes from Yeratse is he'll want and you're at say I, I'm I'm just not seeing how the grammar works. <laughs> you Maybe. are you are doing it for the other person to accept your will. You are causing the other person to accept your will to apologize or to do whatever you want to do. Maybe okay. you could translate it. He's he's wanting he or she are like wanting you. They're desirous of you, which is, I don't know if that's a, I said appeasement's a good translation because experientially it is, but literally um, their desire is positive towards you. Even the word positive is in there. But this is, this is a great Zeke Duke point. Um, and, it's, and I'm glad, Tamar, that you corrected me because that would have lost a lot in the meaning if we hadn't asked that. But the point there is that we can't, ju we can't just assume that people forget us. We actually have to do something to change their feelings towards us. We need to actively change how they feel towards, or at least make the attempt more than just a, a more general, if I did. So tomorrow, I'll have you take the next source as well. We'll actually look at a few sources from Rambam and his Mishnah Torah. Why? Because his, um, of his Mishnah Torah, his book on Teshuvah, on repentance, returning towards God, is by many considered required reading for the month of Elul leading up to Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Because um, not only is it clear and concise, but he basically captures everything in the Talmud, everything up till him about what the process of a real sincere apology, the work, the requirements look like. And what we're going to see actually in some of the sources after that, uh, that is that the Shulchan Aruch, basically everybody reads the Rambam's Mishnah Torah and says, yeah, I couldn't have said it better <laughs> myself, so I won't. I will copy and paste what you said because you got it right the first time. So go ahead, um, Tamar, please, source number three. Tshuva and Yom Kippur only atone for sins between men and God. For example, a person who ate a forbidden food or engaged in forbidden sexual relations and the like. However, sins between men and men, for example, someone who injures a colleague, curses a colleague, steals from him or the like, will never be forgiven until he gives his colleague what he owes him and appeases him. It must be emphasized that even if a person restores the money that he owes, the person he wronged, 
he must appease him and ask him to forgive him. Just pause there. Even, so it's not just a, a physical, you know, I broke his vase, I buy him a new vase. There is a psychological component here. And again, that's that act of genuine, sincere apologizing of making oneself vulnerable. So it's it's much more than just, oh, can I fix the problem? We actually need to engage with the other person on an interpersonal level. Um, please, Tamar, even if? Even if a person only upsets a colleague by saying certain things, he must appease him and approach him repeatedly until he forgives him. If his colleague does not desire to forgive him, he should bring a group of three of his friends and approach him with them and request forgiveness. If the wrong party is not appeased, he should repeat the process a second and a third time. If he still does not want to forgive him, he may let him alone and need not pursue the matter further. On the contrary, the person who refuses to grant forgiveness is the one considered as the sinner. The above does not apply if the wrong party was one's teacher. In that instance, a person should continue seeking his forgiveness even thousand times until he forgives him. So to comment on that last statement there, the understanding behind this in the Talmud goes through examples between students and teachers and how they derive this. But the basic understanding is that if a teacher refuses to forgive a student, it's not them being stubborn. It's because there's some incredibly important lesson that the student has yet to learn. Now, if the student learns that lesson and the teacher then doesn't forgive them, then maybe the teacher is being petty and it's on them. But generally, we we assume we give the benefit of a doubt to a teacher that they're holding off on their forgiveness because ultimately it's for the betterment of the student. Again, there's obviously, that's an ideal situation, black and white in a vacuum, um, but that's where that idea comes from is that it's a teachable moment that ultimately it's better for them in the end. But here, if I go to somebody privately and I ask for forgiveness and I I've done all the work and I'm sincere, like really sincere, first of all, God knows that, but if the person, ref and I, if I'm doing it, then I'm kind of embarrassing myself, which is not the goal. The goal is not to embarrass oneself, but to become vulnerable. And that can be embarrassing. But if I show up with a group of people, um, I've already embarrassed myself, whether it's to the person I'm apologizing to or the three, four, five, six people I come with. But if that person refuses to forgive me, who then becomes the one who should be ashamed of themselves? Not me anymore. I already put myself out there, but the person who refuses to give forgiveness. So again, the goal is not to embarrass someone, but it's to force somebody to, to, to shine a light on themselves and to feel the shame of not doing the right thing. I've already put the shame on myself. I've already made myself vulnerable by offering, uh, by giving a sincere apology. If the person refuses to give it without a good reason, and they can do it, they don't have to say, I forgive you the first time. They can simmer a little bit. They can be angry, but at some point, the onus is no longer on me. So that's a really important lesson. If I go into Yom Kippur and somebody that I hurt refuses to ever forgive me, they say, I, on my deathbed, I will never forgive you. That's their problem. I don't need to feel embarrassed anymore. I don't need to feel guilty anymore. That's on them. And the fact that I bring people with me is partly to give me strength, but also as witness to the fact that I did this. And in Judaism, we need witness to us doing things, witness to testimony, witness to trial, witness to weddings, and in some cases, witness to doing the work of apologizing. But if I've given my the, the real college try and the person says, forget it, I'm done. And even though they haven't forgiven me, I can go into Yom Kippur and I have done a kosher apology if I've done the sincere work. Questions up until now? On those two sources. Beautiful. Susan, the next one is also from, I'll have you take the next two because they're relatively short. Next one, this is all, you can see this is all from the second chapter. So if you read one chapter in Rambam's Mishnah Torah on Teshuvah, read chapter two. It's the big, it's the good one for Yom Kippur. So go ahead, um, Susan, please. And one of the questions, why do we even need forgiveness? What's the point? What does that have to do with anything? So please, Susan, source number four. It is forbidden for a person to be cruel and refuse to be appeased. Rather, he should be easily pacified, but hard to anger. When the person who 
wronged him asks for forgiveness, he should forgive him with a complete heart and a willing spirit. Even if he aggravated and wronged him severely, he should not seek revenge or bear a grudge. Excellent. Now, I don't know if this, if, if this is said in one of the later sources, but it came up in a lot of my readings. If we become the kind of human beings who forgive others and are merciful and kind and forgiving, um, we hope that who else becomes merciful and kind and forgiving to us is God. But if we become stubborn and cruel and we say, we're not going to, we can lord it over them. I didn't do anything wrong. He or she hurt me. Why do I owe them an apology? Well, then why doesn't God do the same thing? So this is a bit of, and we have this a lot in our tradition. We hope that our actions here will inspire um, God to act the way towards us. If we show kindness towards others, then God shows kindness towards us. If we forgive others, we believe God forgives us. Um, and also it just, if we're the kind of people who never forgive, it, it makes us into a certain kind of person. Forget about not forgiving people. If we're the person who has no mercy, we're not just not forgiving people, we're probably hurting other people actively too. If we never forgive, then we're going to end up constantly needing to ask others for forgiveness, and they may not give it to us. So the act of not forgiving is a slippery slope. It's a rabbit hole towards negative behavior that reflects on us and brings down divine judgment quite harshly. So it's not just the value of apologizing, it's also the value of forgiving. And again, there's a little bit of um, a, a tightrope we can walk. We don't have to forgive right away. We can have that moment of, I'm angry, I'm not ready to forgive yet, but we can't hold onto that hate forever because if we do, it consumes us. And if we hold on to hate forever, so too God might hold on to hate forever. Now, what, any questions on that source? Excellent. The next one here is really interesting. And I know it has come up because one of my friends um, from one of my previous shuls did this. He had a father and they had an incredibly pain relationship, um, just really with just a, a, a verbal abuse and perhaps even more. And despite all that, um, my, my friend wanted to, he had also you know, done things to hurt his father and he just wanted to both apologize and forgive him, but he waited until it was too late. And that's how he understood it. He felt it was too late. So the question is, is it ever too late to ask for forgiveness. And that leads us, Susan, go ahead to please source number five, again, also from Ram Nam's Mishnah Torah. Okay. If a person wronged a colleague and the latter died before he could ask him for forgiveness, <clears throat> he should take 10 people and say the following while they are standing before the colleague's grave. I sinned against God, the Lord of Israel, and against this person by doing the following to him. Oh, and then you admit it confess it in front of your nine other people. If he owed him money, he should return it to his heirs. If he is unaware of the identity of his heirs, he should place the sum in the hands of the court and confess. So, so there's two parts here. It's one, it's actually undoing whatever wrong I might've uh, done. If it's a physical one, fix that action. And, and it's interesting here, if that person is no longer in the world, what responsibility do they have towards them? Now, if I wrong them in a way that also hurts their family, fine. But again, emotionally, I haven't done anything. I had no relationship with them. So the question might be, who is this for? It's not for them. They're gone from this world. They're either, they've either been reincarnated as another human being or they're in heaven. They don't care about what I say. So who is this for at this point? The, the person doing the apologizing. Probably. It's an act of healing for us. And that's really, really important. And again, I think those eight tips from Psychology Today and many other long form articles, and, and, and I'm not a psychologist, but ask a psychologist, they may agree. A lot of the process of apologizing isn't just about the apology of itself. It's the, the therapeutic work that one goes through to get to that point. And it's not always that complicated. I may have, you know, again, you know, messed something up. I was supposed to pick something up and I forgot to. And, you know, someone was just upset with me. And just admitting, you know what, I messed up. Again, it requires that moment of vulnerability, admitting I was wrong. Nobody likes to do that, but I don't have to turn my life upside down to take responsibility for my action. But I imagine many of us have had relationships where we really hurt someone or someone really hurt us. And a simple apology, even with the right intentions, was nowhere near enough to, to start this process of healing. And the benefits, as Rambam point, the negative, as Rambam points out, is if we don't do this work, it can deeply hurt us and change the kind of person we are for the worse. But 
if we do this work, it can also change us for the better. And again, that can be reflected in the way that God treats us. If we show mercy and understanding and vulnerability between each other, then God can show the same to us. The next source here from the Shulchan Aruch, very briefly, it doesn't necessarily add anything new, but it's really cool because it basically shows that, you know, he and really the tour and those before him uh, read the Rambam and said, this guy got it. Now, the Rambam himself is reflecting the rabbinic tradition from the Talmud, but in many ways, that's also just as beautiful because it shows that rabbinic tradition for thousands of years has thought deeply about this incredibly important practice that's not explicitly written out, these whole you know, process in the Torah and the, and the prophets, it's hinted at here and there, or it's shown as examples by people doing it. But rabbinic tradition has gotten the sorry, the apology pretty right um, leading into Yom Kippur. So the Shulchan Aruch says, Yom Kippur does not atone for sins between a man and his comrade, fellow man, until he conciliates him. Another uh, uh, translation there for Yeratze. Even if he angered him only in words, he is required to appease him, his fellow man. And if at first he is not pacified, he must return and go to a second and a third time. Third time's the charm. Each time he should take three men with him. And if on the third time he does not become reconciled, he no longer is obligated to him. Uh, nevertheless, afterwards, he should say before 10 people that he did request forgiveness from him. You know, again, kind of witness. It's almost like signing a contract that I did it. Um, if he really did it sincerely, I, the person was wrong, was his, oh, but if he, the person who was wrong, was his teacher, he must go to him many times. It doesn't say a thousand, but, you know, and many until he is appeased. And here there's actually a different word for appeasement, uh, yitpayes, um, which tomorrow, I don't know um, if you, if that's how you would translate it in modern Hebrew, yitpayes, um, isa. Good translation. You're happy with it? Yeah. Excellent. So there are multiple words for it, but but the powerful takeaway from all of this is it requires a lot of work. And it's not just about the sincere apology. It's how it uh, affects us as people, how it affects the person who is giving forgiveness, and how that's reflected in our relationship with God. If we have broken the relationship with all our people by not apologizing or not forgiving, how can we expect God to not uh, you know, take stock of that? We go into Yom Kippur saying, God, we're good. Will you forgive us? Well, if God sees that we have no mercy, we have no sense of taking responsibility, we're just saying, oh, God, sorry, I ate pork. How can God take us seriously if we can't genuinely? And again, eating pork is something which is incredibly important to our tradition, but it doesn't feel emotional. Breaking Shabbat is so core to our religion, but emotionally, you know, it doesn't hurt God in the way that it does if we say to someone, they're an idiot or we hate them, or we want to get away from them. That kind of damage is much more visceral. And if we can't work on that, then why is God you know, going to want to work with us? So it shows that not apologizing and not forgiving have so many more repercussions than simply some groundwork done before Yom Kippur. So again, posting on Facebook to, as uh, I think Susan said in the chat, 2,000 people or plus, uh, I'm sorry if I hurt you, it's lovely, but it doesn't really do anything. Um, maybe it does show that I'd like to start that process, but unless you've done any of the actual work, then it hasn't accomplished anything. And all of these sources show that the goal of apologizing is to create a process, is to appease the other person. Now, if I call up somebody and says, I might have hurt you, I'm sorry, and the person says, that's all I needed to hear. The fact that you cared enough to call me, that person is appeased. So sometimes even just calling up the person that if I hurt you, it's not enough, but it is an okay start. But the Facebook thing, it's really hard to argue that. And then by the way, if you Google articles and say Facebook apology before Yom Kippur, every source from secular newspapers, Orthodox reform, everybody excoriates it and says, this is the worst thing ever. And again, I don't actually see that so often. It's usually more of a phone call but the truth is preparing for Yom Kippur is not easy. But I'm hoping I didn't hurt most people this year. I'm sure I did. I'm sure I hurt some people. And I'll try and reach out to those people if I can think of it. Um, but I didn't hurt everybody. I don't think I need to apologize for 2,000 people. If I was a politician, then I have a lot of calls to make. But this isn't about making a blanket apology to everyone who I may have slighted unknowingly. This is about genuinely working on a relationship. Susan, yes, please. Yeah, um, 
I almost forgot the question, but I'm what so happens if the person, the person you're supposed to take three people and with you, what happens if the person lives in another town far away um, and you cannot easily take three people to, you know, with you to visit that person? Yeah. So th there's a few things here. If one assumes that I I personally have been able to visit them and I've done my due diligence and it's gotten to the point where they're not doing it anymore and there's no way for me to bring witnesses, then I would jump to the final thing as if it's you know a person who you can no longer access them, essentially dead. And I would get together a minion at shul and say, I can't get to this person. Now today, um, I think many rabbis would rule, you could do it over Zoom or over the telephone. But if genuinely someone moved to the other side of the world and we never fixed our relationship, but I, I need to do that work. I need to be vulnerable. I need to, and again, it's not about embarrassing, but I need to put myself out there and there's no way that I can get to the new country, you know, the golden of Medina, America, while I live in, in Spain or, 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 or um, Italy or something like that, then going before a minyan um, would be that, that proper work before Yom Kippur. Now, if I have another chance to go to that person, I should definitely take it. But there's a there's a two things we're balancing here. One is actually repairing the relationship. That's the ideal. The second thing though, is putting in the effort. And if I've genuinely put in the effort, first of all, I bettered myself. If I'm willing to become vulnerable, that makes me a better person. If the other person writes me off, that's on them. Ideally though, we work together and we become stronger and, and the love and the friendship elevates us both. But as long as some work is done, it helps us and it prepares us to face God. And at the end of the day, that's not the only thing that's important. God says, I don't want to hear from you until you've done the work with other people. God values that. It's perhaps more important because God is not hurt by us breaking Shabbat. Shabbat is an incredibly important thing about our loyalty and our obligation towards God. But God doesn't need us to, you know, God doesn't need our apologies per se. God needs us to be people that take responsibility and are willing to improve and get better and regret doing bad things. And again, I don't want to, I, I, I can't say I'm speaking for God. I'm trying to reflect the text and traditions um, that we have. But it seems to be that the tradition is reflecting that God wants us to spend more time on each other because you have the whole month of Elul. You really have every day of the year to ask for forgiveness. But how long does it take to say sorry to God? One day, maybe three days if you include Rosh Hashanah, the two days of Rosh Hashanah. So this last text here, again, it's a brief text, but I think it's really lovely. And again, it talks about the power of forgiveness um, by uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs Atzal. Uh, and I believe this might actually be a, a, I'm forgetting the word for it, but someone took a video of his and, and wrote it down, transcript um, of a talk that he gave. Um, but you can see the video, it gives it here on YouTube. I can share with anyone who would like to see it. So he says, or said, have compassion on your works, forgive. That's what we say on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So that's actually a quote he's translated or translated in English. And the days between, the Aseret Yemei Tshuva, the 10 days of working on um, Teshuvah repentance. But it cuts both ways. We can't ask God to forgive us if we don't forgive others. We have to forgive those who have offended us, however hard it is, because life is too short to feel resentment. That's so true. It's trite, but it's very true. Loti con veloti tor, says the Torah. Don't bear a grudge and don't take revenge. It's, it's a sin. It is a commandment to not resent and bear grudge. And again, there's a moment where we're human. We can be angry for that moment, but we have to get over it. The Torah demands we get over it because we can't be, you know, we can't have relationships. We can't be a good person if we carry around that baggage of resentment. At the end of his life, Moshe said to the Israelites, don't despise an Egyptian because you were strangers in his land. Strangers in his land? They persecuted the Israelites, enslaved them, tried to kill half their children. And by the way, he doesn't say this, but the Egyptians didn't start that way. They actually welcomed us and for generations loved us as, as strangers. So we owed them a lot, even though eventually the new Pharaoh, uh, the new Paro turned against us. But his point here is, don't despise them. They were despicable. But what Moshe, Moshe was saying was, if you continue to hate, you will still be slaves, slaves to the past and your resentment. And if somebody goes into Yom Kippur resenting everybody that hurt them, how can they have a sincere Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah? If you want to be free and have to let go of hate, and that's still true, our energies are too precious to waste on a past we can't undo. 
No one can offend me without my permission. And I refuse to give bad people the victory of knowing I care about what they say or do. On these holy days, we have to let go of hate. We have to forgive. And we will then travel lighter through life with less grief, more joy. And that's one of the really important things here. It's not just about kosher apologies. It's about kosher forgiveness. Because if I am willing finally to put myself out there and be vulnerable and the person attacks me, I'm not going to want to apologize anymore. And the Torah says you got to try more than once because humans don't always accept it. Anger is something that is very human and it doesn't disappear like that. But if we hold on to that anger for too long, then it will consume us. And the person that has the work of becoming vulnerable before you, you need to be vulnerable before them and forgive them and open yourselves up to letting them back in. That's not easy. But again, if we can learn to do it with each other, then of course God can do it with us and God can open up God's self to love us again, to forgive us and embrace us as we literally do teshuvah, we return home. We return to the relationship. We return to the good place that we wish we could always 